Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Tyler Behrens, and I'll be your moderator to, for today's presentation as we kick off the afternoon sessions of day two of the Secure 360 conference. I'm excited for today's webinar on AppSec in a world of digital transformation. During the webinar, you may submit questions for the presenter at any time using the questions pane of the control panel. We will aggregate them throughout the presentation and ask them during the Q&A at the end. Now to introduce our speaker, John Dixon. He is an internationally recognized security leader, entrepreneur, and principal at Denim Group. He has over 20 years of hands-on experience in intrusion detection, network security, and application security in the commercial, public, and military sectors. As a Denim Group principal, he helps executives and chief security officers of Fortune 500 companies and government organizations launch and expand their critical application security initiatives. As a former U.S. Air Force officer, John serves in the Air Force Information Warfare Center and was a member of the Air Force Computer Emergency Response Team. Since his transition to the commercial arena, he has played significant client-facing roles with companies such as Trident Data Systems, KPMG, and Secure Logic Corporation. Turn it over to you, John. All right, Tyler, thanks a bunch. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Uh, I think this is the first rodeo uh, for all of us doing this virtually. So uh, I'll do my best. I see that we have almost 150 people online, uh, which is great. Uh, so well attended. Uh, I won't have the normal feedback mechanism that I do uh, of, of smiley faces or people frowning in the audience. So uh, uh, you know, I, I welcome you to follow me on Twitter, email me. My email address is john at denimgroup.com or ask questions afterwards. So uh, absent of that feedback mechanism, uh, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, and, you know, maybe we'll be so lucky as to have the occasional dog or child interrupt our, our session. That's, that's happened to me multiple times. And uh, I, I think I'm on, like, uh, probably – web uh maybe my 250th webinar slash zoom slash webex slash now go to meeting session in the last month so <clears throat> look forward to it well this session uh today is about uh the the, the realm of application security uh, or software security or whatever you want to call it, the software the security of software in a world where the tech stack is being incredibly disrupted. Um, I'll use the term digital transformation, which is really a consulting term word. I, I, I'm not entirely comfortable with it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it's one that's overused to the uh, point where if you, if you throw out the term digital transformation amongst security folks, you'll see eyes roll. But I don't have a great way to describe this any other way. And I'll, I'll try to explain what it really means. What it really means is the behind the scenes incredible churn around the tech stack that supports applications and I'll, I'll i'll walk you through this and explain what i mean uh i'll define it again a, a really a business consulting term i'll talk about <clears throat> the real business stuff behind this i mean because i work primarily with CISOs and cso's who have one ear to the ground of their team they're looking outward uh, for security stuff but they're also listening very close to the business and trying to pick up uh, the, the the signs of where the business is going. And this is one thing that's driving uh, activities and the, uh, the expectations uh, for turning around feature requests are breathtaking. I think all of us on this call probably recognize that. You, you're probably shaking your head. It's like, I got an example, but you'll see what I mean in a second. And if you don't have an example, <clears throat> I'll explain to you, you know, kind of what we all know intuitively is that as consumers, we see what goodness looks like around digital transformation and we see what badness looks like so if you don't if you're not at the core of one of these initiatives you will at least kind of understand as a consumer um, i'll talk about what this represents as an opportunity for you to uh, wedge in or shoehorn in or hack into the this transformation uh so security things it's an opportunity is what, uh, what the way i put it and then I'll talk about kind of how security looks in this new world, different from the old world. And I don't mean this in the sense of old world, like pre-COVID-19, but I think uh, much of what we're talking about today will be accelerated by that. So as Tyler mentioned, uh, ex-Air Force guy, KPMG guy, used to have less gray hair. Um, I was doing a presentation at a ISSA New York session, true story. 
And I got up and I was like self-conscious about my gray hair. And, and I, and one of my, uh, I said, look, I felt really badly about it. Uh, and, uh, and then, and then some guy said, yeah, you look kind of like Anderson Cooper, you know? And I was like, okay, that guy, sure. Whatever. Uh, I was probably going more for the George Clooney look, but whatever it takes. So I've been in the app sex space for a very long time. And what I do primarily is I advise senior leadership on the security side about how to uh, push their application security programs. Because unfortunately, you know, I, I felt that application security remains the most discretionary or most uh, voluntary of the security disciplines. Uh, you can, in fact, release security products or excuse me, software products without security checking. So we'll talk about a little bit about that. Uh, ISA, ISSA Distinguished Fellow, and I, I got my CSSP uh, right out of the Air Force in the late 90s, so I have a super low number, 4649, and uh, have been paying $85 a, a year ever since. So um, uh, the background of our company, we're uh, based in San Antonio, Texas, and in Austin. <clears throat> We've got about 90 folks. We're in the realm of software security, app security. Uh, we spend a lot of time in this space. We also have a product called ThreadFix that does... Uh, vulnerability resolution in the application space. So if you've heard of us, I've been to the MSP area. I've spoken at this conference multiple times in person and also at the Milwaukee version. So, um, and I'm saddened because I do like visiting uh, Minneapolis and Minnesota in the May, June timeframe. I also worked a project in my earlier days at one of the very large retail uh, companies up there <clears throat> in January through March of one year. So, uh, kind of a, a different environment so I'm, I'm sad i'm not there in person so let me get going right just dump into this i already kind of stole my own thunder and said i don't like the term digital transformation it is overused and it is a term that the the big consultancies have used the the mckinsey's the you know the big four uh and it, it really is all about automation and you know uh, big data and a, and a variety of things that allow businesses to react quickly and exploit particular uh, things, uh, particular opportunities in the marketplace uh, fast. And, and, I, and I think uh, we've seen kind of a variation of that with COVID-19, which is, you know, these companies that were fairly prepared for working from home. Uh, I called it work from home readiness about two months ago, right after RSA, where we had certain companies that just like pivoted and start, everybody started working from home. They've been doing this. Everyone had laptops, uh, VPN connections. And we've had other clients who <clears throat> have struggled in the last two months because they had a very on-premises culture. So we see like culture driving behaviors, driving things like digital transformation, but ultimately um, it is a business strategy. And, but we, as IT people, and then by extension, security folks, we're really on the receiving end of this. We're at the, the tail end of the dog and being wagged by the business as it, as it probably should be, right? Uh, but it's an opportunity. I mean, like, like what you see a lot of now is you see a lot of organizational changes. You see, I, we have at least two large clients where the CIO used to be, have a very, I call them the imperial CIO, had a very centralized IT function, owned the network, owned dev, owned a lot of things. Well. The debt, he now reports to the um, you know the, the 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 VP for digital transformation or the chief digital officer. I've seen that happen in two large firms. So you start to see this happening. And so what I'm saying is that this is stuff that's coming to us as security professionals, whether we recognize it, agree with it or not. But but what that's changing is the way that we build things, the way that we deploy things. Uh, and they're all happening at the same time. So they're not happening in isolation. They're happening at the same time. So let me just tell you two stories, partially because uh, people remember stories and, and partially because this is absolutely the case. Back in the day when we traveled, uh, uh, I, you know, in addition to using Uber, I was the guy that would use Avis all the time because I was, you know, like super spoiled and really used to you know, just walking up and my name was in the, uh, on the board, I walked in, I wasn't, I was probably on a phone call or conference call from the time that I jumped on the rail car bus, the time I'm in the car. This is again, when I'm not using Uber, but when that happened, 
it was the case. So that was I'm that guy. I fly fly a ton. I'm I'm I'm, I'm you know I'm just used to it. And what I and, and so like pick whatever air carrier. I mean what they what the, what this what they did is they had all the behind the scenes things tied together. Um, now granted, I had to give up a little bit of information like my frequent flyer stuff, and you know I had this. But like the cool thing was if I, my flight was late, they had a API that talked to the Southwest Airlines app and updating app. And so they knew that I was late. So they sent me a text and said, hey, you know, your car is now over here. Um, I get off the bus uh, and then, you know, my there's my car. It's at now at, at slot C74. All this stuff was seamless. And, you know, magically I walk up and there's my Porsche. Uh, but but uh, but what happens is they, they've tied all these things together between the, the, the web experience, the mobile experience, the uh, customer service rep has situational awareness. Uh, as I said, the display board, when you come, all these things. I mean, there's some conscious uh, architecting of all these things to make your experience seamless. So when you see this as a, um, as a, uh, as a consumer, you just like take it for granted, right? And we have, um, I'll tell you another great example is all the stuff happening obviously now with, uh, with, with our friends at Amazon, but also we have a local, a uh, very large and successful uh, grocery store chain in our backyard called HEB. And they had already done a um, curb service uh, and they'd already implemented uh, it about six months ago. Timing was impeccable. But like, if you think about it, the other common denominator with digital transformation, it's not just an IT thing, it touches everything. So these guys had a, you know, grocery to curb service, you pull up, you have a mobile app. Talks to the web. You can order off the web. You can get an update on the uh, uh, on the mobile app. It's texting you updates when you come to the slot. You text them. They are aware of it. Um, there's a physical component to uh, picking up all the groceries, and obviously they can't spoil. So there's like a whole like component. This is like half IT, half like delivery production, but it works really cool. I mean, like so you order this stuff. You can order it. You magically show up. Uh, they also do delivery to home too, and as uh, so, so those are pretty cool things when you have them. And like in the last eight weeks, they've been a bit of a lifeboat for everybody, not having to go in the stores. Contrast that, however, with other less uh, awesome experiences. So, me being the frugal um, person that I am, uh, we went to a to Albuquerque about a year and a half ago for Christmas. And uh, I was like, you know, I'm not going to do Avis because they, they're, as you might imagine, Avis and Hertz are a little bit more expensive. Let me use one of the lesser brands, and because um, I could save 200 bucks, that was my uh, that was my rationale. Bad call. So experience, customer experience was, you know, like no text, no nothing, no interaction. Um, I can, that's I'm I'm okay with that. I'm on vacation, but I dropped the family, my wife and kids, off at the uh, the luggage pickup, and I said, hey, I'm going to jump on the bus. It's like five minutes away. I'll go bring the car up. You take your time, stuff. I get to the facility, and um, first of all, I get to wait in line. You know, like that's that's a not, not a good experience because I had to actually check in. Okay, we're on vacation. Took me 30 minutes to get to the front line. Now I'm a little bit frustrated. Oh, by the way, my car wasn't ready because it was the first of the year. It was actually January 2nd, uh, a year and a half ago, and the license plate had expired. So let, let wait a second. You have to wait a few minutes while I get a second car. So of course their you know asset database didn't talk to their reservation database. So they were upside down there. I'd also had a toddler at the time. Still do. He's a little bit older. Um, but you know, I said, hey, I need a, a baby seat. And they pull up the car. Now we're like an hour into this. My wife's calling and texting me, like, what the heck's going on? Kids are melting down. And uh, they pull up the car and it has an infant seat in it. And I may be like a not the best dad in the world, uh, but I know the difference between a toddler and a baby seat. And I was like, okay. Long story made short, this lasted for like an hour and a half. And it was awful. And the only connection was the dude, you know, was the person. That was it. Uh, it was the guy behind. That, that was. There were no web services connections. There was nothing. It was like 
reservation system in isolation, fleet management in isolation, car, let's go run out and get a car. And there's me. The only connective tissue was the guy behind the console. That was it. So, I mean, that's like, like you, you, like now that I've told the story, you will probably be more observant of stuff like that out in, 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 the, in the world, assuming at some point we can go out and rent cars and do other things. But that was for me a bone drawing personal experience. And my point for telling this story is that you do know this stuff, right? You experience as consumers, even if you're not on the receiving end of a digital transformation uh, you know, project internal. And what's driving this? I mean, and again, I, I, I mean, like if anything's the last 60 days or 90 days is, is like this imperative to move quickly or to, to in this case, quickly adjust your business model. Uh, so business, the business leaders, the functional leaders, the VP line of business people want features and functionality like super fast. Um, there's a lot of pressure in the marketplace to either transform, to have better customer experiences, or in the case of what's going on right now, to adapt uh, to a curbside pickup, you know? And so like the thought there, what that means is that you have to have, that you from the get go have to think a particular way. Uh, and the, you have to architect it so that the, that, that the order uh, component of it uh, is is maybe a service, a, a microservice or a web service that allows you to then say, okay, it's the physical console in the store or the physical app. It talks to those things. It doesn't really matter what the endpoint is. It also infers digital initiatives that there's a lot of use of, of uh, behavioral analytics that you really know what customers do. So that we won't talk as much about that because that's more of a data science uh, component and more of a marketing component. And, but it is true. And then ultimately customers are better at appreciating what goodness is. We're better customers. What, what, what this means for you though, as the IT person, as a security person, is that rollouts of product features or requests from product features are measured in days and weeks, maybe even, I'll say a day or hours, but the ability to, to take from concept to execution an idea. And that infers a whole back office of capabilities that allow you to adapt and adjust. You know, uh, you can't go, go order 90 uh, servers for your data center in, in the time frame. You have to be able to quickly set up a service and connect to, for example, a cloud component. Um, what it also infers is, is that via systems, specifically web services, that you're highly connected uh, throughout the organization and that the, the automation is not only a, a prerequisite, it's, a, it's an absolute here. Uh, automation in the form of deploying software, automation in the deploy, uh, in, in via containers to stand up capabilities either on-prem or off-prem in the cloud. It also means that, like I said, organizational changes are accelerating. You have much more, um, I think it's the erosion of the imperial CIO, the the, the CIO uh, functions being spread out across businesses, uh, and 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 just closer moving. I, I give the example of the uh, of the curbside pickup that I had mentioned. I mean that that is a I mean that takes all disciplines, right? Customer service, IT, automation, and then also you know, just the store layout component of, now you have to put a refrigerator and be able to pick these things up in a way that's, that, that you know, that if the customer's not as late by 30 minutes, you're, all your stuff doesn't spoil or melt. So that's, you know, you start to think like the, the idea of the alignment with the business, which is largely a, you know, kind of a cliche. I mean, it really needs, means you need to know the business. You happen to be an IT person, but you're really a grocery store person. Uh, you're an IT person in that role supporting the grocery function in that example. The other thing is, and we'll just be candid here, is that security might be a consideration, but time to market is, a, is, is the number one driver. It is, in fact, paramount. As soon as you recognize that, then you have a different worldview and it changes the way you operate. We don't have, in this world, the strong gating function that uh, in a more 
assembly line world you might have. What I mean by that is, you know, we are going to have a security check on this before we may put it into production. Um, I see less and less of that. Whether or not that's right or wrong, that's that's to be debated. But like, really, if you're Netflix, you're worried about Amazon Prime and their, you know, Prime Video. Uh, you're you're looking over your shoulder uh, at capabilities uh, for others. So all this is in the context of of a changing tech stack. I mentioned it, and many of you uh, are probably experiencing this right off the bat, and are you know are painfully aware. But what this means, and what we're seeing, is that all at the same time, you see a widespread adoption of things like microservices, things like serverless applications in the in the cloud, newer and um, and and different frameworks and languages in the programming realm, all delivered via pipelines, CI CD pipelines. So when I hear people say, oh, we're doing pipelines, okay, cool. That and what else? You know, like it's not just pipelines and CI CD or sec DevOps. It's not that in isolation. It's all this at the same time. And so that's a challenge because the world is different from what uh, it looked just a handful of years ago. The problem is this. This is a guy named Gary McGraw. He's the founder of a company called Sigital that uh, got bought by Synopsys. Super good guy, smart, smart man. Uh, one of the early thinkers in the app security space oh. and software security space. And, and he created what he called his touch points for application security that were very like linear, like you do all these different things. You come up with requirements, architect and design, test plans, code, test, test, test. You see, he created these touch points throughout of stuff, of good security things you should do and add to the mix. The problem is that is looks like a very waterfall type way of doing, of building software. And as a matter of fact, you could go so far as to say it does, in fact, look antiquated and looks like an assembly line. And that's not the way that software is being built as much anymore and is changing. So you can't really have touch points if you're in a highly automated realm. Uh, and we'll talk about that for a second. So, uh, again, I think that the way we build software has changed more in the last five years than the, the, the 20 years before that. And, and we'll talk about that, but part of the challenge is we never really solved this problem, AppSec. And for those that are in it, uh, they know that like, like we really never got our arms all around this. Um, the dirty truth is that most of the automation still remains optimized for web applications written in compiled languages, .NET and Java. So like if you have a web app written in .NET, and it goes on prem, then easy peasy, super duper. Um, if you have one written in a new language, delivered through pipelines, landed at AWS, uh, really the fidelity of the tool is something that you have to consider. Uh, and, and obviously, the automation tool vendors are aware of this. Uh, so they're changing. But, like, a great example is all, everyone's struggling with this idea of how do you uh, deal with microservices? And how do you license them? How do you do that? So on top of it, you have web application firewalls that have been out uh, in the marketplace for a long time. Originally driven off of the PCI DSS, driving the mandate saying you have to have a pen test or a web application firewall, which in fact, everybody bought them and none of them, very few put uh, rule blocking rules in for a very long time. And so, you know, when I always ask, you know, do you have a WAV? Cool. Do you, what, what, what rules do you have in place? Oh, you don't have any. Okay, cool. That's pretty neat. Uh, layer seven logging device, right? Um, so automations, automated scanning still was is is not solved. I mean, like you still can't understand custom logic. You still can't understand auth and auth issues. And outside of the biggest companies, you still have an issue of coverage. I mean, of of like like people don't scan or test or most of their applications on a recurring basis, uh, on, a, on, a, on a frequent basis. So that's the truth is like this problem was never solved and it was quite messy. And then now we're going faster. So 
there are some ideas that you can do um, given the world that we live in, right? Uh, number one is be aware or have somebody aware of the fidelity of those testing tools that you're using uh, for any pipeline, right? Partially because you might be given a window um, and that window is a finite window to run your test. In addition to every other test, uh, regression testing, uh, you know, all the testing that happens in a pipeline. And what I what we see is people building up uh, either on the front end or on the tail end some type of approach to to mitigate that. Uh, and like I said, uh, mitigate the challenge that maybe you only have a finite window to run a scan application scan against an app before it goes in production. If you are if 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 you are are lucky enough to have a security scan in the pipeline, that that is a best practice. God bless. But then the devil is in fact in the details. Like, what are you exactly using? Is it you're probably not running the full-blown Fortify or Checkmark scan or you know IBM source scan, excuse me, HCL source scan. You probably don't have that that latitude. So you're probably going in just to scan a subset of the vulnerabilities. And if that's the case, then what what are you doing for everything else? So um, and then in the world of microservices you're now starting to worry a little bit about where you infer trust from. If you have a single purpose app that does just one thing and you've already been authenticated into that environment, like knowing where you would, where you derive trust from becomes important. And then maybe that's something that the testing tools have a, a difficult time inferring. So that, that means things like threat modeling are important, right? I mean, like, like the basics of threat modeling, which is a mindful decomposition of the highest level functions of an app. Where does the data go into the app? Where does it reside? Where does it come out? What do I trust? What, is it tr what do I not trust? If you can at least do that on a whiteboard in layman's terms, you probably are doing better than most. The last thing I just wanna emphasize is you have to be mindful of where the app lands. Again, uh, if it were a data center, you always had the, the controls of the uh, you know, the data center and the security team to protect you from doing crazy stuff. If it's in, uh, you know, AWS, Azure, GCP, maybe not so. So that's the challenge. Oh, here we go. All right. So here's the one thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into as well. Um, because where it lands matters, and because the app dev team and we observe or the pipeline team might own the uh where the app lands may look may own the cloud instance you have to provide prescriptive guidance to those teams about what security goodness looks like uh you can you can call it a cloud reference architecture those are a lot of big words you can just call it a, a template you can call it here's if you're using gcp this is what you, here are the settings that you should use, here are the controls you should use. Um, this, is, will, this will help you prevent some of the most egregious examples of people accidentally sharing from a console an entire S3 bucket, for example. Uh, don't assume that your very talented dev team or uh, pipeline team fully understands the, um, you know, the implications of certain actions. So I, I do think, you know, in general, with the absence of this type of guidance, the devs will do what they do, which in most cases, the exceeding like majority cases will be the right thing. But one, once in a while, they make a mistake. And because you don't have those, you know, the controls that you would have in a data center, you're really up on, on your own. So this is one thing we see over and over is much more uh, prescriptive guidance. And it's good because it also changes the security role from that of an audit blocker to a risk consultant to the dev teams. Here's the stuff you need to do. If you're, again, fortunate enough to have controls and say, thou shalt do this, even better. But at least you're providing that. That infers that you know some of this stuff or you have somebody on your team that knows it. And if you don't, you hire somebody. Hire somebody, hire a consultant, somebody. But you got to know this stuff. Um, streamline threat modeling, another practice that we see um, promulgating. And this is, again, threat modeling is the, I would say, the most uh, fruitful effort at the earliest stages of dev. And you're essentially articulating 
um, the ins and outs, the ingress points, the egress points, the data storage points, and you're doing conceptually uh, what should needs to be done before you write a li line of code. And what this is important is, is because in the world of microservices and web services and others, understanding where you are getting data from, where trust boundaries exist, becomes even more important than it was. Uh, and then throw in, uh, in, in uh, cloud and all the different stuff you inherit there, this becomes very important. And if, so if threat modeling isn't a competency that you have, that is something that you should hire to or get some others to help you work. Because And what I've talked about is not the heavyweight you know, Microsoft stride and dread model. It's more like whiteboarding in five minutes, the highest level thing so that a non-developer can understand it and then go from there and then kind of drill down. So threat modeling uh, across the organization at early stages before a line of code is written is fantastic. Um, help your dev teams become consultants to them on the, the pipeline issue as well. Try to inject as much testing as you can, full, knowing full well that there's a full line, a sequence of other tests and automation that's happening, and recognize where the challenges are in this round. Like if you aren't able to get everything you do in that one kind of uh, truncated dynamic scan, then maybe you should do a dual track model, which is like, look, for major re uh, releases, I'm still going to do a source code review in parallel, but uh, for the incremental releases, I just want to make sure that the, you know, the the beta 2.0.1 Friday underscore release doesn't uh, inject a fatal flaw at the last second. You know, so for more of the incremental or daily or weekly builds, um, that might suffice. But you still need to do threat modeling because they might make architecture mistakes, make make trust mistakes. And just get better at this. I mean, iterate and tweak and, and, and have any relationship with the pipeline owner uh, allows you to essentially get in front of a lot of these issues, eliminate stuff that you would never even know about, and do so in a way that is just imperceptible. This is versus the traditional way, the 11th hour scan, which is what I would say is the, you know, like, here you go. Um, it's 11 hour. Let's get the security guys to run a scanner at it or do a pen test. And sure enough, they blow it up. And sure enough, you got to go back to the business owner, <clears throat> a non-technical person probably, and say, here's a SQL injection, and here's why we can't go into production. Oh, you've told Wall Street that you're going into production on June 1. Okay, great. So, I mean, the, the, this pre pre prevents a little bit of that 11th hour testing pressure that is always a poor outcome for security. I mean, you're either going to rush it in production and say, well, the heck with it, we'll get it in the 2.1 version. You'll ac you know, accepting the risk effectively. You'll stop production and break the build, which is bad. Uh, and then the last thing is, is you just like, again, um, say, hey, look, we're going to try to fix it. And it takes forever and blah, blah, blah. So let me just wrap up because I do want to have enough time for questions and answers here. And I know it's been um, probably even more proportionally than I would have in person. Um, just re recognize when you hear the term digital transformation, I mean, your first inclination may be to roll your eyes and kind of go, oh, great, here it comes. I, me too. Uh, but, but realize it's really a cover term for like crazy churn in your tech stack. That's really it. And it, op it is a total like transformation of how you check security for applications. It's an opportunity. It's also a risk. It's a threat. Um, you have to have people that understand pipelines, that understand cloud. And if you don't have them, hire them. If you can't hire them, go to you know somebody, a third party. But this represents an opportunity for you. I mentioned the pipeline examples. I, I, it's, a, it's an opportunity to, like I said, I use the term shoehorn, the metaphor. It allows you to inject, <clears throat> probably a, a bad metaphor, it allows you to introduce uh, scans into the pipeline. It's just one other scan. Like, hey, you guys are doing all these testing, you know, it's build, build as part of your commit process. You're doing all these different automation that just throw in a security scan or two um and it you know it just happens right so that's pretty cool it also allows you to transform who you are from an audit person that is dr no that gets to you know break the build and like when walks in the room everybody's like oh great here's a security person here's darth vader changes to more of a risk person and ultimately our challenge as security people in this realm is to get others to do on our behalf 
what they probably should be already doing anyway, which is to make their applications more resilient, more secure, even if it's not an articulated business case or a requirement. And here's the ultimate incentive, and I'll end on this note to leave plenty of time for questions and answers. If you don't get this right, you run the risk of recreating the same problem that we had with web applications, which was we didn't really re recognize the risk until several, several years into it, and there was such technical debt and so many lines of code out there that we can never catch up. This presents a, an opportunity to kind of get a little bit of a clean slate and to at least secure the, stu the new stuff that's being put out there in a way that might change the attack surface in the future. And so it does uh, present an opportunity that you should not miss. Uh, ultimately, it changes your role from that of a security person to maybe a marketing and consultant Jedi and somebody influencing uh, others. But that is, if you recognize that, what we found our most successful clients are the ones that, that do that and recognize that. And so with that, I'll wrap up my formal remarks and throw it back to Tyler and give us uh, plenty of time for questions and answers. So appreciate your attention. And it looks like I, we had 181 attendees and y'all stuck with me. So thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Great, thanks, John. That was a wonderful presentation. Learned a lot myself. So we do got a good set of questions already coming through. So I'll just start uh, winging them over to you. So the first one here we have from John is, how many organizations have you seen where software engineers have primary responsibility for security or close to that? That's a great, great, great question. I would say, <clears throat> Wow, and, and we do work for mostly the big guys. I mean, like it, uh, it, it's probably Fortune 2500. I would say that's, I mean, this is anecdote, John, but it's 25%. I'd say anywhere from 20 to 30%. Uh, we have at least two of the big telcos where uh, the function of, uh, of static analysis or source code scanning and dynamic testing have, have completely migrated to the dev groups. I would say it's about 25 to 30% pure anecdote, not Gartner numbers, not consensus numbers. Uh, but I, I, I do think that's changing. And part of this speech is to get, and this, the ideas here is to get those things in to the dev world. And when dev leaders view security and resiliency as one facet of software quality, then we have succeeded. So it's a minority, but it's getting better. Do you see a difference in that, I guess, part B of that across sectors? So, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I won't pick on anybody, but oh, yeah. Uh, so the, the, you know, the probably the, the bleed, the, the most security concerned, as you might imagine, are the financial institutions, the banks, the investment houses, the, um, you know, the insurance companies are probably the most sophisticated. Uh, then, you know, you've got the cool, the real big tech, names that you might be aware of uh, and then it kind of goes from there behind that maybe retail uh and then just go down the list i mean we're um based in san antonio which is about three hours away from houston uh, i would say the oil and gas are are laggards except for the biggest ones um i think the the real the shells the exxons the uh, bps the schlumbergers are pretty good at this stuff but if you get everybody else, they, uh, yeah, it's the, uh, I spoke at the American Petroleum Institute uh, last year uh, with uh, Joel Scambray from NCC and Jeff Williams from Contrast. It was like, like two other guys I think very highly of and smart people. And it was like the saddest presentation there. Uh, there was like, like 20 people in the audience. And, and so I, I think they're laggards, um, but, I, I will say this too: the the real tech startups are also different because, you know, they're they're less uh, uh, focused on uh, security and they have like all the cool like open source stuff. So that's a different challenge where they may be secure, like thinking about security, but um, like they're using all this open source stuff and GitHub and GitLab, and so uh, that's a little bit different one. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Uh, next question comes from Wayne. What security would you try to bake into the CI/CD pipeline? 
uh, and then followed up yeah. with SAS and DAS. <clears throat> I, I uh, what okay so let me repeat the question what 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 would I bake in the pipeline? I would I would focus on three things you know stuff before the pipeline stuff during the pipeline and stuff after all driven off the type of technology that you're making if it's a web app and the, and the testing is straightforward maybe less of a risk if it's a um, an IoT app or it's something different like that that a mobile app maybe you have to compensate on either end so. What you can do in the front end uh, to plus up if, if you is, you know, software composition analysis, looking at the libraries uh, or, or the modules. That's if you've heard of companies like Black Duck or excuse me, products like Black Duck or Sonotype, um, maybe a little bit more training up front. There's a big controversial area, some standards, like before you commit to things. Um, you know, if, if you, then there's the pipeline itself. And again, as I mentioned, Try to get as much as you can as possible. Um, and that I've, I've heard in at least two companies where it's like, here's your three minute window. Well, okay, well, that, what does that really mean? That means you're looking for one thing on one type of tool, which might, might just be dynamic. Um, so it really depends on the appetite and the culture and the risk of, uh, you know, risk appetite of the company itself. Um, I, the most I've seen, I, I'd say there's probably more dynamic testing uh, than static, but that's, uh, I, I would say that I think that's evolving a bit. I think the other thing that's very interesting in looking at companies like GitHub and GitLab, uh, the trend is certainly to make this stuff more part of the developer stack. And if that's the case, then maybe that'll help a bit before the pipeline itself. Like they just do this as part of their, uh, you know, saving source. The last thing is, if you don't, you know, if the tool coverage is not that great, you get a small window of opportunity, you're really not confident. The last thing you can do is when it goes into production and, you know, the, the famous or not famous, I mean, probably the, the most well talked about capability that the Netflix guys did as far as running a set of tools in production. I think their term was chaos monkey. But like, if you have such a need for speed that you're just like, we're just going to push this stuff out. Um, at least find a way to find out when badness lands in production and to be able to tear that down. That's what Netflix did is they had that capability and they had the capability to turn off stuff that was found to be uh, vulnerable. So those are kind of the three ways to do it. Um, and I would say it's still pretty early. Uh, so we're seeing, you know, like patches of adoption and, and kind of cool trends, but uh, we went to, uh, RS was at Black Hat last year, and then we went to a DevOps conference right after. It was a nice juxtaposition. Uh, I would say there were more security companies there than ever, but it's still like uh, wow, wow, west early days. Okay, good answer. Thank you. Next one also comes from Wayne. Is there a lightweight model for threat modeling that you might recommend? Oh wow. Uh, <clears throat> The, not the Microsoft way. I, 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 we have a particular philosophy, and I'm not picking on the Microsoft guys. They're the guys that invented it, and it became too heavyweight for them to even use. Um, I, I think some of the components that OWASP throws out are great. Uh, I, I, we have a particular philosophy, and we're one of the last. I'm going to say one of the last bigger ones left of the AppSec companies. Uh, but we have really dumbed it down to the point where uh, it has gotten, you know, like a five-minute exercise, a whiteboard exercise. I see uh, companies using products, automation products. Uh, the one that comes to mind is Erius Risks has one, and there's also another one I can't think of from the Chicago area. But I see some of that stuff happening. But the key is to, I think, is to start real simple and do it once with one dev team and make it as 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 stick man as possible and then kind of go from there I, I i the problem is that people want to compare apples to apples and it does you know unless you've uh really thought it through it it doesn't scale well so what i what i have advised and what we advise in general is to is uh, you know ha be consistent do little and be consistent and make sure it's on all the projects versus doing like deep dive heavyweight things that are on a handful of projects and less impactful. The one thing I will pass on to Wayne and, and the rest of the crew here 
it's very interesting from a consultant standpoint. You know, we do a ton of app application testing, a lot of app pen tests. Those results are ephemeral. Like, like the month that we give those results, they've already been remediated and they're off to something else, right? So that the so the, the shelf life of a penetration test or app test is measured in days typically. We go back to clients and see the uh, results of our uh, threat modeling still up on cubicle walls or still in conference rooms. And what we have noticed is that they inform decisions longer in a more impactful way because developers can learn more from that. Um, and so I said, it's two things. One is that is a much more positive behavior than a pen test. It's a much more coaching. Um, but the challenge is to do it across the organization in a uniform and consistent way is a bit of a challenge. And so in order to do that, we recommend to keep it like real light, real simple and more frequent. So hope that answers your question, Wayne. Great, thank you. Next question comes from Michael. Are there any instances in which it's better to go with a separate security mechanism versus incorporating security into DevOps? Uh, well, I mentioned the example of, of Netflix is the one where like if there isn't like if the tool isn't that great or like if the platform, if the product you're making doesn't really lend itself to uh, uh, scanning, then maybe some type of automated vuln management thing on the, on the on the tail end. That's an example. Um, the kind of the out of band stuff uh, gets a little bit mushy. I think the, uh, like I said, training is a good one. I, I, I'm a big fan of having the top 10 dev, uh, you know, uh, uh, approaches around security. You know, not a, uh, not a policy document. Those are too much. Nobody will ever read them. I just like anything that fits on a three by five card to, uh, to inform future behaviors. You know, we shall tra treat logins this way all the time. We shall treat customer data this way. We shall never put out an application that hasn't been at least automated scans. For major releases, we do uh, automated scanning plus penetration test. For web services, we do threat modeling. I mean, like like eight or nine or ten things that um, that that are like not in the pipeline, but when you're not in the room, inform decisions and, and get way upstream of these things. And that's what I'm trying to say is like if you can fortify, no pun intended some of the dev ideas and practices around resiliency before the pipeline, you'll catch more of those off and off issues and that'll augment the technical scanning, which is effectively getting coding flaws, not architectural things. And then again, at the tail end, if you wanna do some stuff in production and watching badness, you know, also people use bug bounties as a separate way to do that. You know, another way, another layer, uh, you know, in addition to everything you do internal, turn on a bug bounty program and you'll get that feedback as well. Wonderful, great tips. All right, next question comes from John. Have you come across software teams that voluntarily break builds for security issues? No, not really. <laughs> like, well, I mean, I'm being facetious. Uh, uh, the ones that are probably in security companies are have uh, close relationships with the security folks. I mean, that's an exception. I mean, like at that at that DevOps conference we went to last August after Black Hat, I mean, the whole thing was about like, how do we, you know, our security is making us do this stuff. How do I, how do I get around it or how do I compensate? It was, it was very interesting to go to that show because I mean, mostly we go to security shows and we hear people preaching the converted. Well, here's, here we were at a DevOps uh, conference, like parachuted behind enemy lines you know, uh, and, and hearing how it was characterized. So I, I think uh, the vast majority of developers are under such tremendous pressure to get stuff out that unless they have a strong security culture or their security product company or there's in a regulated industry, um, those are gonna be big time exceptions. We're hoping to change that. That's why we do these kind of presentations is to, to switch that around. But, you know, we've seen We've seen environments that still surprise us in 2020, where you're like, geez, these guys don't get it. You know, are there, are, and then they fight over, oh, that's a false positive, or oh, no, that's a feature. And it's like, ah, okay. So that still happens. Okay. Good take on it. 
So our last question that's currently open right now, so if others have questions, uh, please submit them in. Uh, last question from David. What do you think of tools that perform interactive security testing, i.e. they scan the code every time it executes to ensure that it still has its integrity? Here's what I believe. Uh, I asked is another great approach, absolutely no doubt about it. You know, SAS and DAS are probably the ones that most people use. I see IS as being very promising. Uh, and uh, I would highly encourage it if possible. And then throw in, uh, as I mentioned, software composition analysis. Uh, and again, the, the interesting thing to explain to people, primarily people that don't have an app dev background or app sec background, is if you run a network scanner, you effectively get 100% of the network vulnerabilities. I mean, effectively. I mean, like, like if there's a server uh, if there's a patch level that is on the server that's not right, that's a very black and white and serial thing. If the TCP port is open, yes, it's open or it's no. Those are straightforward to check. In the app world, you use one or two or three or maybe multiple technologies and try to triangulate truth. So I think IS is very promising. Um, I would throw, I, I mean, I most certainly the case uh, and then there's also the runtime stuff that's out there. Uh, application security, uh, essentially uh, capabilities that run on the server side in production to look at badness. I think if you threw that in, those are the ones, and we see IS way more uh, now than we did. And I know guys like Contrast and others are out there beating the bushes and doing doing well, so. Great, wonderful. Uh, John, this has been a good session. We're out of questions, so if you want to do a last minute wrap up here for the folks. No, I would just say this, like I've, uh, it's it's been extraordinary and unusual. I, I don't use the word unprecedented anymore. I, I stopped doing that March 22nd. I don't use the word or phrase new normal, uh, but I would love, love to get feedback. I mean, I got at least 180 of y'all stuck around for a while. Um, so that's my Twitter uh, handle. If you don't, not into Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and as it as it turns out, my email is super easy. It's john at denimgroup.com. So email me and just let me know how it went because I I love to I'll write a blog post about this. Uh, I first ever hoping this is an exception and not a, a a new standard or new way of operating. And I look forward to meeting all of y'all at some point up in Minneapolis or at the next conference. So thanks so much for your hosting. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, John, and thanks for those attending. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you.